Romans chapter 5 and chapter 6. We're going to read that. And I'm going to go into detail on a couple of things. But I, I, I'm, I want you guys to listen to this again, if you would, again. And um, follow with me, if you will. Here we go. Chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith. Uh, let me stop there real quick. Because the opening line to this. It's beautiful being justified by faith. You know what it means? You're not justified by what you do right. Nor are you condemned by what you do wrong. Yep, sorry, Satan. Nope, you're not condemned by what you have done wrong. See, this day is fresh. And what you did yesterday, it's not in this day. It does not pollute this day. The only way it can pollute this day is if you allow it to enter into your mind and you drag it to this day. Right? Otherwise, it does not exist. Because in your heart of hearts, in your heart of hearts, all of us do the same thing all the time. Every single last one of us do the same thing every single time. We'll do things in a day and we'll say, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish my thoughts were not like that. Well, guess what? They're not. They don't exist today. Today is a day of washing. When the Lord allowed you to occupy this day another time, and it's not yesterday, right? When he allowed that, that is his grace. That is evidence of his grace, not punishment, not some kind of cruel joke. It's grace. And if he has grace for us, he also has some good for us in this day. There's always a blessing in the day you wake up in. It is. There's always a blessing. You, you cannot bring self-condemnation into this day, this hour. Anything you did in the past, whether it be foolishness or something good, today is brand new. It is brand new. Let's continue to read. So we are justified not by the good works that we do all the time, not by what we communicate right or communicate uh, the best. We're not justified by every breakthrough that we can somehow cause somebody to have or attribute to. No, we're justified by faith. That is also a gift. And that faith that we're justified by is what? It is that you believe in the Son of the living God, that he died on the cross for you. Listen, for you. He died on the cross for you. That's what you need to say to yourself. This morning, Christ died for me. And never forget that. All too often we say Christ died for somebody else's sins. We're always pointing, aren't we? We want everybody to have the good news. But how many times do you wake up and say, wait a minute, Christ died for me. He died for my stupidity. He died for my foolishness. He died for my purpose, premeditated sin. He died for the unknowing things in sin. He died for all death I may have caused. He died as I'm, for the, what I inflicted upon others. Paul persecuted the church. And he was forgiven. He didn't have to reap that. He died for it. Christ died for it. He died for all of us. That means you're not condemned. That means you're alive today. You're alive today. You're not dead today. You're alive. You're alive by his grace. And if he has grace for you, his eye is always upon you. That means he cares deeply about you. He cares about all these things in your life. He knows about all these things in your life. Every thought you have is transparent to him. He knows why you do what you do, and he still will not shove you away, but he desires to raise you. Why? Because that is the Father's heart toward you. No matter what gunk you may think you're in, you're justified by faith. You didn't make yourself believe in Christ. The Bible says, Jesus says, all who have come to me, the Father hath given me. And I will in no wise cast out. Did you hear that? He will not cast you out. Why? Because you believe upon him. He already knows we do goofy stuff. Kind of like a baby kitten. Right? B uh, baby cats. Have you guys ever observed baby cats or baby dogs? They do the craziest things. You don't condemn a baby cat or a baby dog because they break something in the house. Because they do this. Because they may poop on a very expensive rug. You don't condemn them for that. Why? Because you know they're babies. Well, your Father in Heaven knows you're, we're, we're babies, we're children. We're not only children, we're His children. He's not going to condemn us because of some of these weird things we do all the time. 
No, he seeks to raise us because despite what a child does, even your pets, when they're young, despite what they do, you desire to raise them. You desire for them to do what? To live on, to be healthy. So you constantly pass a sentence and you say, nope, you're going to live today because if the baby chokes, you're right there. Aren't you? When, when it's, when, see, when a, when a baby cat is mad because it can't get to a toy, to the baby cat, that may be a disaster. To you, you understand what it is. But if that baby cat falls over, you're right there. If anything serious were to ever happen to any one of you, the Lord is there. He's there. He's right there. Hmm? Do you understand? So you're not castaways. You're, you don't have this heavy condemnation, but we all come together in Christ. And above all things, no matter what man says, because all of us by our own heritage are pulled in certain areas. We have that common ground of Christ, which seems to supersede all other things we could ever have in our lives. You know what that also means? Your life is not being threatened. Who can threaten your life? When the hands of the Lord himself are all over you. Satan is loud, yes. You know what the Bible says? He, he, he's walking around like a roaring lion. It never said he was a lion. He makes noises like a roaring lion. He makes noises like he's the biggest, baddest animal in the earth. But he isn't. He's just making noise. Most of your threats are by noise, by message, aren't they? Let's continue. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand. Do you guys understand? Verse 2 is beautiful too. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. The, you know what that word stand is, right? To have, we have access by faith by our belief in Christ. Into this grace wherein we stand. Now that word stand is what you're living for. That word stand is why you're alive. How you're living and what you're living for. It's a very inclusive word to stand in something, right? And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Many of us go through many things and we don't rejoice. Because we don't understand the process. That's natural. Don't you know that's natural? When you go through something and you're not rejoicing, right? It's natural for us to be upset, to be a little fearful. It is. Let's not dodge these things about ourselves, but to be forward and honest about them. Especially when it comes to what you're feeling inside. So that as a group, we may be complete one to another. Never assuming another person is not frightened, is not scared, right? But to realize that all of us have different quirks about us. But you know what's so beautiful about a body is? Where you are weak or somebody else has a weakness, you have a brother or sister who's strong in that area. And collectively, you're impenetrable. Collectively, you are the body of Christ. Collectively. And not only so, but we glory in our tribulations also. Knowing, that's if you know, knowing. Now, this is for those who understand what their trials and their tribulations are for. A great many people do not, and that takes wisdom. So be patient with those who are very sorrowful in the day. Be an encouragement to them. Be a great encouragement to them. Not telling them everything is going to be okay, right? Because... I want you guys to think about something. To speak in a truth is not to tell some, somebody that everything's going to be okay. Do you know why? Suppose a person got themselves into a bind, and a real bind. If you go to them and say, hey, everything is going to be okay, but then the next day they get arrested, you just pass to them a very confusing message. But if you give them the word, you equip them, right? You see the difference? If we try to console them with our own words, we can deepen the wounds they'll have. But if we give them the word, we equip them with the truth. 
Does everybody see how that works? Because indeed, some people are going to go through things. What are they? Trials and tribulations. Which means you may catch them on a day when it's just about to break loose. And then they go through something. Well, telling them it's going to be okay may not be adequate words for that moment. But you can equip them with the word and let them know, hey, if, if they're willing to listen, then tell them. If they're not willing to listen, be patient. Only speak to those who desire to hear. Never force the word of God upon anybody. The word of God is by invitation. To those who have ears, they will hear. To those who don't, it's not their appointed time yet. Be gentle with the word. Remember it's holy. Remember also it's alive. The word of God is, is, is alive. It is the source of our life. So remember that. It's not just a set of phrases that you argue about or give to somebody. It's alive. So when you're speaking a living word, understand it's spoken by God's throne, by his power and authority. And it will go out and perform. So don't utilize it. Just to throw it around to comfort people at a whim. Don't do that. But equip people with the word. Equip them. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. This is, a lot of people, they don't quite get this, and it's okay, because they will in time. In time, in, in, in good time. And patience, experience, and experience hope. And, and this, in fact, is a blueprint to how your life goes on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you understand this or not, right? You will have a trouble in your life. That trouble causes you to wait for an answer. You never get an instant answer. That's why it says, tribulation worketh patience. Patience is like a muscle. It must be exercised, right? That means if you have a trouble in your life, and no one is able to help you out immediately. That is normal by our Father's standard. Tribulation works patience. How many of you have prayed for patience? Many of you have. You said, Lord, grant me more patience. Well, guess what? He's telling you how patience is gained. You have to get a workout for patience. You have to be in a position where you have to wait. Hmm? Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience. Patience, why does patience yield to experience? Why? Anybody know? Why does patience yield to experience? Why? Why does it, it, why does it always result in someone's experience? If you want to become wise, right? We have the steps also of wisdom. When God grants you or gives you wisdom, He's going to do it in this way also. A trouble comes, works your patience. That patience gives way to experience. Because while you're waiting, you have all these fears going through your head. As soon as your trouble comes, your imagination blows up like a balloon. You, you'll frighten yourself to death. You're thinking of all these scenarios. You're in a panic and everything else, but all the while, nothing is happening. You wake up and the problem is not solved. Your stomach is turned upside down and all the while nothing is happening. Then all of a sudden before you know, before you realize what has happened, a deliverance process is taking place slowly but surely. Things are worked out in your life. You're not living behind this uh, quote unquote mask anymore, but you become more of who you really are. You start throwing down what you have presented to people and you start going to people as you actually are. So it beats these troubles that come to your life. They beat down your flesh. That's all. They take that wall down that we have erected. They, they, they uh, rip that presentation that we give to everybody. And we begin to present ourselves. Well, this gives you experience. Experience in what, though? That the Lord's going to deliver you. That you will have all sorts of fears when a trouble comes. That you have to watch your own imagination because it can scare you to death. But the Lord has never failed to get you out of everything you've ever been in. If that were not true, you wouldn't be here today. Because according to the word of, the, of God, a trouble that is of Satan is designed to kill you. 
is designed to make your soul rot, to turn you away from the living God. But it has not worked, has it? Think of this. Satan's entire plan is to make you turn against Jesus of Nazareth. It hasn't worked. And almost doesn't count. Forget about the word almost. All of us almost didn't find Christ. Huh? So almost doesn't count. Look where you are right now today. Satan's weapons, his most vicious weapons, did not work. And why is that? Because your Father in Heaven has sent you here, not to die, but indeed to live. Never forget the Father can consume all darkness in a moment's notice. He didn't need our permission or anybody else's permission to make another decree either. For the sake of his truth, we're going to see prophecy unfold, but make no mistake, he can end everything right now. He does not need our support, our prayers, or anything else. He can undo everything he did because all things belong to him. He can set things right and anew at any moment. So you should understand that what he's doing is for the raising of his children. Don't forget what you are to become. Don't ever forget that. Not one of us knows the form we're going to be in. We have hints to it. But God did not make the human mind to be able to encapsulate what we are to become. We only know that we'll be like Christ. You will be like Christ. So this isn't some mere, you know, story. This is not Hollywood. This is real life. You were not sent here to be condemned. You were sent here to experience. You were sent here to learn the truth. And if you're going to learn the truth, you're going to learn the truth about light and darkness. Not just light, but light and darkness. Our lives are undeniable. No one can ever say that darkness did not face them. Because you saw darkness face to face. But you live. Our Father desires us to be able to live with the truth. That is, to have knowledge of good and evil but to choose the good. There's a big lesson in Genesis. When the Lord said, man has become like one of us, knowing good from evil, that should make everybody cry. Why? Because there's little difference between us and those who dwell in the heavens. The only difference is, we're in a body, and we have a limited amount of time of life in this body. That's it. We're mortal. No one's forcing anybody at the throne to do good. They're choosing to do good. What was the lesson to Cain? Cain, you must master sin. What was the lesson to the Israelites? You must choose to do good. You must learn to choose to do good. Why does God send why does he send calamities? Why does he stricken his own people? You know what he said one time? He said, why should I stricken you anymore? You'll just rebel more and more. You know what he also said? His correction was seen by all. And they ignored it. What is God's correction? Calamitous events on the face of the earth. But if you listen to scientists, they're going to say, Earthquakes and volcanism and all this other stuff. That is just, you know, it's on its own. It's happening on its own. No, it isn't. It's all managed. All of us managed. You can read in the book of Daniel and see that the watchers have been replaced. The watchers that fell in Genesis, they have been replaced by loyal watchers. And when they man their stations, they govern what happens in nature. They do. It's not doing everything on its own. See, that's Darwinism, of which I do not subscribe. Nor do I support it. I don't have a mindset that nature is doing what it's doing on its own. We should have all been destroyed. Every volcano should have went off already, but it didn't. Everything is managed. Everything is. 
Remember that. So patience grants us experience. Patience does. Huh? Patience grants us experience and experience hope. Now listen to me. Hope. Do you know what was being experienced over the last few days? It was a loss of hope. It was a it was a it was tragic, it was, and it really bent me in the spirit. And what I mean by that, when people lose hope, I, I think I'm very sensitive to that. When people lose hope. Extremely sensitive. It feels like uh, feels like I'm being crushed. Like I'm having a heart attack when people lose hope. But why do they lose hope? Let's be honest. I've talked to, I, I've heard countless people so far who really thought that they were going to have to pull their children from school, that they were going to have to go hide. may seem a little foolish. There were millions of people who felt this way. And through their sorrow, that sorrow was very real. Some people cried uncontrollably. It was very real to them. But why? Because they believed in a message. They really believed that. And when it went the opposite direction, they were crushed. Now, we're not just talking about worldly people. We're talking about Christians were crushed. They were crushed. They really thought that it was the end of America. They really thought that the military was coming in to arrest all Democrats. They really thought that because they, they believed what they were hearing. They really believed that. It was a lot of confusion. Even the days after, it was a lot of confusion. You could, you, it was, it was um, palpable is what it was. It was, it was very uh, recognizable. It was a darkness, heavy darkness. It was gloom, hopelessness. And that hopelessness came because their experience was broken. In other words, they had, they had themselves in a troubled time, in a very diverse time. So they patiently waited on a resolve to come forward. And when it looked like it was coming forward, it failed. And it yielded, the, the experience was not yielded then. The experience is like the glue. It never came. And without the experience, there's no trust, there's no bond, there's no hope. And when you're hopeless, when somebody is hopeless like that, it does something to the soul of a man. It's a good thing, but it's painful to watch. See, the hope was broken in the words of men. That's the good part. The bad part is the suicide rate climbed to an all-time high. It's awful. And some of that still continues to this day. And you know what that means? We have a job to do. We really have a job to do. We have a heavenly job to do. Some people will not have encounters like you've had encounters, but they will see you. But if you're not positioned, if you're not in position to give them a true holy word, not our words, not your words, not what you think, God said, but to arm them with the word, you're out of position. And it's time for all of us to be in position, not out of position. N not one of us should be hopeless. Though if you are, you're not by yourself. You see how important the gospel is? Not these philosophy teachings that go out. But the gospel, the good news, to affirm that good news before, because you can easily lose control through imaginative scenarios. So listen, this is why I'm reading this. Let me continue to read. For when we were yet without strength, what is that? When you're without strength, you're in what sin? You were part of the world. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Thank you, Lord. When you had no strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And that was a long time ago. For scarcely, 
for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, folks. That's a very heavy, targeted type of love towards each and every one of us. But I want to ask you something. Do you accept it? Do you accept the Father's love upon your life? See, there's a problem if you don't accept it. You're going to be you. You're going to pursue love. You're going to be on the hunt for it. Whatever you're hunting for means you have not found it. When a person finds the one true thing they've been searching for all their lives, they stop searching for it. There are great many people who still search for it, and I tell you that's part of a trick of the flesh. It's part of the trick of the flesh of a type of comfort. We seek a reassurance. One time, Christ was sent for the ungodly. And we were once children of wrath. If you so much as lied, you broke the Ten Commandments and you were guilty of breaking them all. If you stole something for even from your own parents, if you took something not authorized in your own house, that's thievery. You're guilty of breaking all the commandments. We were indeed children of wrath, and we didn't even know it. Worthy of God's wrath. But Christ died for us. We heard the call. We're answering, I'm going to say we're answering the call, because a lot of people believe in Christ. They don't believe Christ for themselves yet, and there's a problem. When you believe Christ died for you, your life changes. If you can't believe that Christ died for you, that's when you're full of sorrow. And it's incomplete. And Satan... Satan wants nothing more than for people to be incomplete. Well, I'm sorry. The Lord called some of us radical folks who don't operate like anybody else to come to the forefront for a season, to operate very differently, so we can work in an environment that others may be easily deceived in. And I'm telling you right now, accepting Christ is not just to believe in him, not to believe that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead, no, but to believe that for yourself, that he died for you. Because when you believe that Christ died for you, you will not condemn yourself. You will not mope around, but you'll realize that you have been clothed with righteous clothing. You have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. That all the stains and the spots you would ever have in your life are being washed off every day you wake up and believe in Christ. Now to believe in Christ is to believe in his cause. And to believe in his cause is to live by that cause. Something simple as the civil rights movement. Those who believed... In the work of Martin Luther King, they spoke on behalf of Martin Luther King. They didn't speak against him. If we believe in Jesus of Nazareth, we believe in his gospel. And to believe in his gospel is to believe that everybody who has life is given a chance for redemption. That everybody... Every one you would ever see with your eye, Christ died for. But the, the question is, do you believe that? Because in the Bible, it teaches us, God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. It also tells us that God created evil. Now, how many people don't even understand that? God created the good and the evil. 
Why is he doing? Why did he create the evil that seems to be against you? That's the whole point. It seems to be against you. But the only one holding you back is you. Because if you subscribe to the report of darkness, you're not going to move. You're not going to stand up. You're not going to rejoice. You're not going to recognize the mercies of this hour. You won't do it. In that context, created means he made it. Because it said the good and the evil. It didn't separate the words. Which, by the way, is a whole Hebrew term. The creator of, and the same word was used for the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. That word created means the same thing for good and evil. That's very important for us to understand. Why would God create evil? For us, not against us, for us. Darkness is a potential. Every element God created is important. The good and the evil. Yes, it would be good if evil was gone, but let me tell you something. If you had nothing against you, how then would you know that you chose God out of all things? Huh? How would you know that? How would you know? If evil could do anything it wanted to, and if God didn't want evil around, he would end it. Why didn't he end evil in the beginning? Why did he separate good from evil? Do you know what he did in the beginning? When he separated the light from the darkness, listen close. Have you guys done your homework in Hebrew? When he separated the light from the darkness, do you know what that actually means? The key is in Genesis. Listen to me close. Adam and Eve ate of the tree of good and evil. What is the tree of good and evil? It's to know the whole potential of everything. That's all it is, is to know of the whole potential of everything. They ate of the tree of good and evil. So they learned what good and evil was. Listen, it is a potential from everything. Listen to me. That's what good and evil is, a potential for everything. When God separated the light from the darkness, he separated the potential. He separated all potentials that lead to good and all potentials that lead to evil. He separated them. He made them two distinct things. God did that. And when he did that, he did it for a reason. If God did not want us to see any type of evil, we would never be sent here on earth. We would remain in him. Why would a person have to go through this process only to be within God at the end? Then why take them out in the first place? Can't you see what he's doing? Especially in Genesis, when he said man has become like us, knowing good from evil. That's the key right there. When you know good from evil, what do you choose? What do you choose? He said, man has become like us, knowing good from evil. What do you choose? What do you choose? That's why you're here. That's why you're here. He doesn't want robots. When you were in him, you were part of him. You were part of that light. But when you were sent here to earth, you were introduced to dark and light. When you're introduced to dark and light... You make choices between darkness and light. And when you make those choices in the end and you choose the light, what do you become? You become independent. You become a true child. God is raising children. His children that will forever follow him and never be given over to darkness. They will never choose to do an evil thing. They will choose to do a good thing. A righteous thing, a wholesome thing. That's what your whole life is about. That's why darkness is here. Didn't he answer that in Isaiah? Yes, he did. He permitted. Hmm? That's
that's what he desires. Because in the end, you're going to be joint heirs with Christ. The angels that first fell, they chose darkness and they fell. We're going through a higher qualification, much higher than they, which is why they serve us. They serve us for a reason because we're going through a much higher qualification. Not some lower qualification, a higher qualification. They are not joint heirs with Christ. You are, which means what? Just as Christ was tempted in the wilderness, so shall you have good and evil before you each day. God said, I put before you good and evil, didn't he? Didn't he say that? He is the one doing this. He is the one that brings the trouble. And what is that trouble? It is darkness. He allows that darkness. What did he tell Job? Job, you don't know what's going on. Stop trying to define me. You don't know what you are here for. And you don't know what my scope is. You only know what's been told to you. Don't overstep your bounds. You exist for my pleasure, for my cause, for my purpose. That is so very important to know. Because the church suffers an identity crisis, which is why they try to cause themselves to have an identity here on this earth. They need not do that. No more than Israel has to cry out to other nations. They don't need to cry out to America. They don't need to cry out to Russia. They need to cry out to the Messiah. And the day they do that, the day they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that'll be the day everything is done. We can't forget that either. Hmm? Christ died for us. We didn't die for him. And if he died for us, what does that tell you? If God sent his son to die for us, then there's nothing in the heavens or in the earth that's going to halt this process in your life this underway. He will break all that can be broken. All of you have a heart's desire, a fulfillment desire within you. All of you do. All humans have this. But you cannot reach it. Mankind replaces things to try and make that very real within themselves, only to fail at the end of the day. And they pursue this on a continuous basis. They pursue it. Because it's not meant for anything on earth to fulfill that, but the living God. That is the purposed void, the hole in you, the hole that causes you to chase everything to fill it. That is a purposed void. That void is so you find your way back home because you've tried everything to fill it with everything. And it's not working. Yet, when you're called, Unto the Lord, and you begin to learn about him. And then when you truly accept him, and then when you truly believe in his cause, that's the day you find it. And you'll never depart from it. That's when you find it. You won't depart from it, because you'll understand it exists nowhere else. The only way you're going to know that something does not exist anywhere else is to try all avenues. That's another big portion of your life that is purposed. People have tried to find what only God can give through other people, through places, through things, promotions, through all sorts of avenues, only to find that what they were truly looking for only exists within the Lord. And it takes 40, 50 years to accomplish that in a lot of cases. The Lord does that to secure you, that you will never be lost to him. All these purpose things in your life are not accidents. They're not coincidence. They are purposed. 
Even the beast itself is purposed. The ten kings, God puts it in their hearts to give their kingdom unto the beast for one hour. God does this. The hatred the seven heads have against the woman who rides the beast. Who do you think orchestrated that? The same one who orchestrated all the armies coming down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The same one, and if you know the story about the three unclean spirits, which is a lengthy story, then you'll understand the whole thing. Because one of the three unclean spirits possessed the mouth of Satan himself. Satan is a stooge, much like Judas, a vessel that one of these three things infested for a cause. God's doing what he does on purpose and nothing is out of control. We would do well to learn his ways, to yield to what's happening in our lives and to realize that the Lord knows what he's doing. It's not some act of cruelty. That's what causes us to get so frightened, to get so scared, to get worn out. Because we get tired of dealing with darkness. You don't have to. Jesus has dealt with it for all time. All we need to do is step in Christ and stop stepping back in ourselves. That's what this day is for. It's a brand new day. Listen, things of yesterday need not be bought into this hour. This is a brand new hour. Now, what will we do with it? Pollute it with how we polluted yesterday or count it as sacred? What will we do with it? That's another choice. What will you do with this new day the Lord grants you? Will you excuse what you excused yesterday in yourselves? Will you bring back the same death-based mindset you had yesterday? Or will you agree with life in this hour? Will you look at everything with new eyes or the same old eyes you had yesterday? What will you choose to see? Because I'll tell you something. Whatever we have most in our hearts is exactly what we see all the time. If your heart is full of goodness, you're going to see goodness in every dark place. But if our hearts are full of darkness, that's all we see. That's a limited sight. I think we've seen enough of that. We know darkness is there. A lot of people say, well, a person asked me one time, they said, well, why don't you name the dark things out there? Listen, everybody knows evil exists and darkness exists. Why in the world would I have to name what everybody already knows about? Everywhere you turn, you're going to find what you're looking for. And if all you found is darkness, you're going to depress yourself. I don't look for darkness. I already know that we're in darkness. What you see around you was darkness. What I tend to do is what Jesus did. Knowing the world, he was looking for light and life. I want to be like my Lord was. To honor him through his steps. To follow him. I'm not following mankind. I'm not following some ideology. I want to follow Christ. When he said, come follow me, that word is active even today. And it's your choice whether you do that or not. Sure, we messed it up in times past, but this is a brand new hour. This is a brand new day. And I choose to follow Christ. What were the words stated in the, in, in the word of God in the Old Testament? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a decision made for this day. That we will serve the Lord. And when the Lord said, come follow me, I want to be obedient to that and follow him. Some people, he didn't even say, come follow me. They just followed him anyway. And they gained so much. He didn't have to call them. They said, oh, there's a Messiah. I'm gone. I'm following him. What, you're just going to up and leave everything and follow him? Yep, I sure am. I'm going to follow him. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved.
from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of a son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Did you guys hear that? For if when we were enemies, this is a truth statement, not some haphazard statement, because we were enemies. Think about that for a moment. You were enemies of God because you lived in sin. You slept in the night. You were, your mind was in the world. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, while we were yet sinners. At the beginning, it was determined that the hidden one, Jesus Christ, would come in the first place. At the beginning of time, he already decided he would send the Messiah, the hidden one, the one whose name was never disclosed until it was given to mankind. See, when he gave us a name to call upon, that's when the heavens could call upon him also. Jesus said, or, or, or God said, and then Jesus said something specific about his name. God pointed him out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The prophecy was given to Mary. Now we have a name. All the prophecies that speak of the Lord's name, we have that name now. And that name is Jesus. That's what the name is. Prior to that, we, we weren't given a name. We were not given a name, but now we have a name. And we're the ones called by his name. Those are prophecies also. You know that mystery by reading what David wrote, and then you hear Jesus say, David prophesied of me. Moses prophesied of me. They all prophesied of me, and they sure did. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We shall be saved by his life. See, we were reconciled first. First. That's why it says, as, as, that's why it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were reconciled first. When something is reconciled, what happens? What happens? That means the heart, that's the fulfillment of what? Of Elisha, when the hearts of the children are turned back to the parents, right? Turned back to the father in this case. Our hearts were turned back to the father. That was the reconcilement. People born today, they know who God is. They know who Christ is. It's their choice whether they stay or turn away. But everybody is born a child of wrath. We're born in sin. None of us have an excuse. That's why all have to go to Jesus Christ, because no one is born in that manner. They're born in the flesh, which is guilty already, full of guilty things and, and desires. The flesh desires the same things as animals do, but we're held by a higher standard. So the reconcilement came first, and then it says, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Listen. So it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. When it says much more, even more than that, above that, recon being reconciled. Above that being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We shall be saved. Shall does not mean maybe. I didn't mean maybe. We shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. Why then all the condemnation in the hearts of believers? If atonement has been established through Christ, why the hearts of condemnation? Why the finger pointing of condemnation? 
the same iniquitous ways that were established. Having all these people be upset here lately is the same thing that crept into the church in 2012, 13, and 14. You know what it came through? During that time, people were so locked into prophecy, they forgot about the gospel. They were locked into prophecy and arguments rose to a brand new level. Do you guys remember? And as the arguments rose, it taught people how to be afraid of darkness. Because during that time, people became so skittish of each other. They did not trust one another. I'm talking about in the body of Christ. It, it was like everybody was backstabbing everybody. And what characteristic did we adopt from that? People were so skittish that they started blaming the wrong people. They started assuming things. They started to operate by flesh again. By what they thought, gut intuitions, evidence, feelings. Everybody wanted to look up everybody else to get some dirt on somebody. That was the mindset. And it's trying to creep back in again. Oh, but it's not going to work here. All this legalistic, are, people are going to learn that Satan is a legalist. He will use God's law, and he's just like a prosecuting attorney. He's going to use that law to convict you in any way he can, and he works through people to convict you. God's people don't walk around convicting people. They don't do that. God's people walk around lending a hand, telling them there's good news. They walk around with the gospel, gospel means good news. So they walk around with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not called the bad news of Jesus Christ. It's called the good news. That is that God the Father, in the depth of a person's sins, sent his only begotten Son for the most wrathful of us, that we may be reconciled and then saved. That's why there's no condemnation to them that believe, who are walking behind Christ, who are walking in the spirit, and not after those things of the flesh anymore. In other words, those who have come out of the world. There is no condemnation. Doesn't matter how many times you think you have fallen. Doesn't matter how many mistakes you think you have made. There is no condemnation. There's no condemnation because you have no desire to murder. Because normally the mistakes that you make cause you to fall and you to fall only. You're not murdering somebody else. The murdering spirit are in those in the line of Cain. Men of old who were before of old ordained to be ungodly men. They have a destiny to be cast into the lake of fire. They are the ones who are twice dead and plucked up by the roots. They're murderers. Satan is a murderer. And those who follow Satan try to murder those who follow Christ. They murder by their mouth, by their conversation, against anybody. They're murderers. They cannot help but to murder somebody. That means they're always going to talk about somebody. They're always going to have an issue with somebody. It's our responsibility to rebuke that out of our own lives. Thus, it will never settle into the body. Do you not know that what you do with your life can change your entire neighborhoods? Do you guys not know this? That what you do in your house can affect all those around you. God did not give everybody the level of faith you have. 
That's why you're online, because you can't find anybody close to you who believes like you do. That's why you're online in truth. Because everybody around you has turned out to be what? Hypocrites. You were trying to find some people who really had some faith. Beyond the flesh, you wanted to meet those who really had flesh like you do. That's why you're online. And if you're the one that believes wholeheartedly like you do to the point where people would call you naive, don't you know that you affect your entire environment? You're the righteous in a nation. You're that microcosm of God's elect being in a nation, how he would heal the land of a nation if his people in that nation would humble themselves, repent and seek his face. So then if you do the same, you change your immediate area. Just imagine if all the Christians, the remnant, were to do that all at one time. We'd cover the face of the whole earth in a blessing. But what has happened? What has happened? Hmm. We're learning, yes. But we can't forget what we have learned. First, that that murdering spirit tried to get us to agree with it. That we would be co-conspirators. That we would be just as guilty as they. It tried to train us how to speak death instead of life. I'm telling you back then, people would speak life to themselves, but they would speak death to somebody else on a daily basis. Co-conspirators to murderers. That's what Satan is. Satan is a murderer. But we speak life and see life. Because when the life of the Messiah is in us, we cannot help but to see life, to appreciate it, to forever follow it. And we have no dealings with death. You know what it says? Light has no fellowship with darkness. It states that because it's impossible for that to happen. It's impossible. For any light to have fellowship with darkness, it's impossible for any light to have fellowship with darkness. Though darkness will always seek to have fellowship with the light. To corrupt it. To take it over. The only way light can give in to darkness is if it stops shining. The only way your light can go out is if you stop believing. The great spiritual war is over your faith. It's over what you believe. Why do you think you're bombarded? People come to you, they're dark entities. You may not know who they are, but they will come to you. They will utilize anybody in a moment of weakness in their flesh, and they come to you with one message. Do you know what that message is? Anybody know what that message is? They do this same thing over and over and over and over and over again. They always do the same thing over and over again. And again, they work through anybody in a moment of weakness. When you get frustrated or angry at somebody. See, having a weakness as described in the Bible where Christ is, his strength is made perfect in us. That means you're out of options in your resolve. And you depend upon the Lord. But when you are weak, as far as your faith is concerned, that means you don't quite believe. That a certain resolve is in Christ. You don't believe he's going to do something for you. You don't believe he may get you out of whatever you got yourselves in. You, you don't believe that he's going to save you all the way. When that happens, darkness can use you. And when darkness uses you, it does so for one purpose. It's a recruitment process. 
It wants you to agree with the death of another. It wants you to target anybody. Because Satan knows that if you target somebody, then you're no longer serving Christ, nor the gospel, nor are you standing in the Messiah. But you have agreed to darkness and death. If I agree to target anybody in this world and condemn a person, that means I have agreed to, de to the death of that person. If I agree to the death of that person, I'm out of alignment with the gospel, which is the good news for all. And if I'm out of alignment, I'm not in Christ, but being utilized by darkness. That's what Satan wants you to do. To agree to condemn somebody by way of your heart. Because when you do that, you're not lit up. You're not carrying light. You carry death. And by your words, you will either, either have life or death. You, it, no one should subscribe to the voodoo world saying that you can speak death on another. No, you can't. Because if Christ spoke life over me, no one can speak death over me. Because no one is going to overpower the Lord. So that doesn't work. But you can speak death unto yourself by agreeing with death. While we were yet sinners, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of a son. God put his word to death, the same death that called us guilty. God had it killed. And he resurrected a new word, a word of life. Can't you see that? He put death in the grave. Now, listen, listen. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Did you hear that? Verse 13, sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. Did you hear that one? Even over them that had not sinned, death reigned over them. 15. But not, but not, as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abound unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You know, that's an empowerment. That's a promise. Listen, through Adam, all flesh was made guilty. Even those who had not sinned. And through Christ, the gift of salvation can be given to all, no matter what they are. Oh, my goodness. See, if you can understand the gravity of the penalty of Adam unto all flesh, 
then you can understand the blessing of the gift of salvation unto all flesh. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So it does not, there is no qualifier that you have to be this type person or that type person. Nope. There is no qualifier. It doesn't matter what your background is. That means of every offense man can ever perform, the salvation of Christ can still be given. My goodness. Therefore, as by one offense, one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. You hear that? One judgment came upon all men. All men. To condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Did you hear that? <sighs> For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's a total undoing of what was done. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, made it concrete. The law entered, causing men to realize they're guilty. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How many of you understand that? It says, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been pl planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from now on, we should not serve sin. And indeed, not one of you is a slave to sin, which is why you have to convince yourself to sin. Have a conversation with yourself, justify it in your mind. There was a time when sin was so natural to people that they couldn't even maintain righteousness. That is flipped. Listen, Jesus has undone what was done. I don't think you're hearing me. Jesus has undone the curse that was upon all flesh. It's undone. Because it is undone, the judgment may finally come. Because if we sin, we sin by choice. But for those who strive after Christ, who seek his righteousness, who turn away from sin and still find themselves hiccuping here and there, a true mistake, the blood of the lamb is right there. And no sin shall be imputed to you, only life. That is for those who truly follow Christ. Not for those who would use the word of God to comfort their own lives. Who would use the gospel of Jesus Christ to become popular and turn men against men. Not for them. For those who would seek Christ with all of their heart. With all of their might. With all of their power. With all of their soul who would seek to obey the Lord because they love the Father, who want to believe more and more things of the Father, who appreciate the gift of salvation and those who know it's a gift. It cannot be earned. It is a gift to all by His grace. It can never be earned. And for those who pursue Christ, he has his method of raising you. I have a question for you. You need to ask yourself a serious question. One of the most serious questions you probably will ever ask yourself. And here it is. Do you agree 
with God's method of raising you or do you not? You got to ask yourself that question. As for me, I do agree with the Lord's method of raising me. When troubles come, when my boat sunk, when I'm over my head in water, I will not renounce his method. But I will say, Lord, I, I may not understand, but I trust you. See, we've come to a true crossroads. And Lord knows, he's given some sight to see what road people are going to take. Some people will not accept the way the Lord raises them. And I know what direction they'll take. But the remnant will accept how God is raising them. And the complaints leave and wisdom will settle in. That's one of the most important questions you can ask yourself. Do you agree with God's method of raising you? Because nothing in your life is some accident coincidental Satan getting the better of you nope you have been purposely exposed for the sake of who you are to become God knows who he sent you here to become you don't I don't God does will you accept it or not See, the problem is, we know what we would like to become, but I'm telling you now that God knows who he sent. And many are going to become strangers. When Christ will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you, it's because a person became a stranger. He doesn't know strangers. He knows his children. If he never knew you, you're put in the category of a stranger. Don't become a stranger. The mandate for us was to get things straightened out before he comes and he's coming back. Most people get happy. Yes, he's coming back. Let me give you a warning. He's coming back. That's a warning. Why do you think Paul said, don't be troubled as though that day of the Lord has come, that that hour has come? Why would anybody be troubled? Because their lives were undone. Because they did not do everything that they could do to straighten up some things. So let me give you that warning one more time. He's coming back. And you are to be ready prior to his coming. He's given us all this time to get prepared. He's coming back. And he will not stall. He has been long-suffering. For those, when he comes back, and they're ready for him, meaning they have worked out these things in their lives, he does not come as a thief in the night. Hallelujah. But for those who keep casting things off for tomorrow, he will come as a thief in the night and catch you off guard. He will not come as a thief in the night to those who have done everything today that they know how to do. Listen to me. Take this day. And let's get it right at all costs. You want peace of mind? Then take this day. Take this day as the day the Lord has made with an upright heart and a true cause go forward to get right those things we know to get right. Let's get them right. Let's not focus on everybody else, but let's get things right ourselves. Because he's coming back. That's why no one is to know the day nor the hour. 
Because if people knew the day and the hour, they would wait to the last minute to get everything straightened out and expect to go to heaven. It's not working that way. And for those of you who study the Kano Greek, you found a mystery. I may cover that mystery, I may not. But I can tell you this, for a great many he has already come. And for a great many he will come again. Because that word sleep that's a very significant word. I will not be sleeping. Because today is that fresh start. That's what today is, a fresh start. It's not a day to take the luggage of yesterday with you. Today is a day to cast all your burdens and cares upon the Lord who can carry them. Go forward in his word to establish, to complete, and to accomplish what you know to accomplish. That doesn't mean go hunting the Bible to see what you must do. The Lord has given you something to do. And how many people have not done it? He has given each and every one of us a warning, even by dream, that if you don't do this one thing, you're just not going to make it. How many know what I'm talking about? That you can do everything else, but if you forget this one thing, whatever he gave you. See, because when he gave it to you, it did make your stomach drop. You didn't tell a soul about that one. But he told you. He has communicated that to all of his children. He gave them that task. For some of you, there's some things you have to get right. For some of you, it's a simple confession you have to make. Whatever the Lord laid upon your heart to get it get right, get it right. Because he's coming again. He's not going to tarry. This won't be a Lazarus moment. He's not going to tarry. He's not going to wait. He's not going to wait. Because it's the Father's decrees. Oh, they're going to begin. And in his going forth, that's when the heavens change. In his going forth, that's when all the stars that scientists believe are big burning balls. They bow. They go out. They'll stop shining. Because they will not shine while the great one stands up and is going forth. And in that day, men will learn of their error. How they see the heavens, they will no longer apply again. That's when creation opens up. That's when many will say, I've made a grave mistake. I had no idea. And it's because they didn't want to believe. They wanted their way of creation to be established. They did not accept God's way of creation being established. They sought to change it. Just like the one who changed times and seasons and laws already. Just like the one who has titled himself to be the mediator between God and men, and he is not. He's not going to tarry. I can only pray that people are ready. But I know one thing, today is a brand new start. Whatever was forgotten yesterday or neglected yesterday or ignored yesterday, don't bring it into this hour. But with what you know, be a good steward. Over what you know and understand, be a good steward. Do those things the Lord has given you to do. I know we've all gotten a bit 
lax. And sometimes we can get wrapped up in earthly affairs. And sometimes we can be aggravated or annoyed or even baited by speech, by what we think is real and what we think is not real. But let this day be a day of faith and handle things as a good steward. And be warned, he's coming. And they give us all warning to get things right, to get things ready before he arrives. It's almost like a parent coming back saying, that room better be clean when I get back. If it's clean, you're going to be rewarded. If it's dirty, you're going to be in trouble. We've been given both a blessing and a warning, haven't we? And based on what we choose, we will have. My encouragement to you, take this day and see it for what it is, another opportunity to get it right. Because if we're still alive today, there are things that are undone. The day you have finished everything is the day you close your eyes to this world. If your eyes are open and you're alive, then you're not finished. There are some things undone, and today's an opportunity to do them. So let's see it as such. Go forward with an upright heart, understanding God's love toward you. You're living this hour because God does not want you condemned. He wants you in a fullness to be one of his children. It's not competition. That's what the world does. The world competes. We don't compete. To have an honest and upright heart is not to compete. But to act within the knowledge he's giving you already. Because if you utilize, if you become a good steward over what he's given you, he will add more to you. Many of you want to know many things, but you've got to become a steward over what he's giving you already. Don't neglect the understanding he's given you. Don't neglect the understanding he's giving you. But operate in it. Utilize it. All of it. And remember today is fresh by the blood of the Lamb. There is no mistake in this hour that you've made. So that it be new, if you want to, you can join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Father, we release all of those we hold anything against that our prayers may not be hindered. And we ask of you, O Lord, to forgive us of all of our sins, our iniquities. Forgive us, Lord, for joining in with worldly people to be sidetracked by messages of this world that we would not take your gospel in care. Forgive us, Lord, for any lack that we may have had in communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody else when we knew we should have. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness. We trust in the blood of the Lamb. So we stand before you in faith, being forgiven of all sins, nothing being hindered. And we ask, Lord, that this day be dedicated to you, that you will wake us up on the inside to do a work for you and to learn to utilize what you've given us to understand. Father, light a fire within us that we may utilize the understanding and the wisdoms you've already bestowed upon us, that we may walk in truth, not in competition to one another. But give us eyes to see the truth of your gospel and its purpose and our purpose. Add clarity to our walks, that no confusion may overcome us. Father, as you have declared us light in this world, so allow us to utilize your word as such for the sake of others. But in this hour, Lord, allow us to be reminded of that word upon our own lives. Renew within us that upright and righteous heart, that desire to follow your Son in truth. Teach us, Lord, to see the victory, not so much the obstacles. Teach us, Lord, to speak truthfully, 
not by the mandates of men that are so repetitious in this world. Father, above all things, we thank you for your son, Yeshua Mashiach, without which we could not have life. We do now accept that life. And Father, we admit that our trust in the word, though it may not have been adequate, we are reminded today that that trust is of necessity. And we ask you to guide us in that trust, that we understand our troubles in truth, not just in mind, but also of the heart and soul. And that at work, patience, that wisdom be given and our hope be doubled. That we may also depart a good work into somebody else in this world. Father, teach us not to see the death of everything as was with your original children who saw death and darkness and were punished for it, but teach us to see what you saw. Grant unto us hope according to your word. Add to us as our souls do prosper, so allow us to prosper. Father, let your healings begin according to the walk that you have given us to walk. We thank you, Lord, for the renewment. We thank you for the reminder. We thank you for one another. Father, we thank you for your son. These things we petition for, do affirm, in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen.